Hi guys, hopefully this is going to be a really quick video today um, because I'm afraid this is one of those topics where there's not a lot that really needs to be explained, you just need to learn a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm going to try and go through this pretty quickly um, and then you guys can uh, do a little bit of work from your textbook. Okay, so you need to know about channels of communication um, and the idea is to understand the advantages and disadvantages of different methods of communication, different channels and the ways that we send signals from one place to another. Um, so there are a couple of key terms that you're going to have to understand. Once you understand those key terms, then realising why one thing is better than the other is actually quite simple to do. Um, so we're going to identify how different uh, channels work and why they avoid these problems that you get and these issues. Um, and then it's pretty simple after that um, to potentially think about serial and parallel. Now that was on the old course, it's not on the old course, so I'm not going to talk about it today. If you do look it up though, you'll see pretty quickly. Um, it's a little interesting, but like I say, not necessary for you. Okay, so let's start thinking about some of the problems that we have uh, in communication signals. Uh, the first one is crosstalk. Now, if you think about a wire travelling uh, through space, when I send a current through it, that's going to generate a magnetic field. Um, and if you think about a change in magnetic field, we're actually going to get a change in RF field. So we're actually going to generate um, a signal. We're going to generate radio frequency signals. Now, that's a real problem if you have two wires next to each other. If you have two wires next to each other, what happens is the magnetic field that's being generated in one wire can generate an electric current in the second wire. So what can happen is your signal in your first wire starts to create a signal in your second wire. And that causes a big problem because obviously it then becomes difficult to tell what signal that you intended to be that you're actually transmitting and what is signal uh, due to this crosstalk from a different pair of wires. So you start to put in filter circuits and all sorts of, of issues. Um, so crosstalk is a real problem um, and it's something that we try and avoid. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video now that talks about what crosstalk is. How can crosstalk negatively affect a digital video signal when it's run through unshielded twisted pair cabling? Crosstalk is one of the most detrimental factors when sending HDMI over twisted pair cables because information affected by crosstalk can't be recovered. In many pro AV installations, twisted pair cable is run in bundles or through conduit, drastically increasing the chance for crosstalk. I want to show you what can happen when you have two unshielded twisted pair cables run in close proximity. This is when crosstalk becomes a factor and can ruin a good installation. Here, we're using a traditional unshielded Cat5 cable between our HDMI, HDBase-T, twisted pair transmitter and receiver. As you can see, I have a video signal on the displays behind me. Now, I'm going to simply hold two pieces of the cable from this spool closer together, like cable might be run in a piece of conduit. Let's see what happens. The video signal collapses and my picture disappears. Just by holding the two ends of the cable close together, crosstalk has killed my video signal. By holding this pair together, I'm inducing enough crosstalk to collapse the signal. Imagine what happens when you have 10 or even more twisted pair cables run next to one another from a rack up through a single piece of conduit. When I separate them, which reduces the crosstalk, my video signal returns. So the second problem that we can think about is signal attenuation. And you should remember from what we've done about medical, that attenuation means a signal dropping over time. Um, so here you can see an unattenuated signal first, um, that one's just showing a constant amplitude, and the second one's showing amplitude decreasing over time. Now for both digital and analog signals, this is a problem. Uh, if our digital signal starts dropping below our threshold voltage, then suddenly we will have no signal, everything will be called as a zero rather than a one. Um, and obviously this, this is especially bad when dealing with anything like amplitude modulation uh, in, in waves. I'm trying to modulate uh, an already uh, amplitude-based wave. We're going to have all sorts of issues. Um, so attenuation is a bit of a problem. Um, one of the things you need to know about is attenuation is usually described in decibels. So that is 10 multiplied by the log of the uh, original power divided by the uh, attenuated power. The other way up. Um, whichever one gives you a relatively safe number. Um, what uh, we will often do with uh, communications wires is you'll get an attenuation per unit length. Um, so you might buy um, a reel of cable and it will say attenuation of 50 decibels per kilometre. Um, so that will allow you to work out what your signal attenuation will be um, based on how long you need to run the wire. Um, one of the ways we can overcome signal attenuation is by putting repeaters in. What repeaters do is they take the signal um, and they amplify it back up again. Um, so uh, one of the causes of attenuation in fiber optic cables 
Um, it has little occlusions, little bits in the glass that causes dispersion, um, or scattering of light, so the light that you put into the fiber optic cable doesn't always make it to the end. So one of the things that we can do is have a repeater that takes the fiber optic signal um, and sort of retransmits it, um, again with higher power than it uh, had been dropped off to. Uh, one more thing that's a little bit to be considered is security. Um, so this doesn't happen, this doesn't have an issue these days, um, but in the early days of telecommunications, um, if I wanted to find out what you were talking to someone on the phone about, I could come along, get two crocodile clips, and physically clip them into the wires. If I did that, I could then record the voltage in the wires, and I could get your conversation. Um, obviously, that's not very good for privacy, um, so we had to physically secure the path that those wires take. So one of the things that is still on your course is a little bit about the security of the uh, communication methods. Now, that's not such an issue anymore because we have encryption, and encryption means that even if you can completely recover the signal, um, you can't uh, tell what it says. However, encryption doesn't come up in the CIE course, um, so you still need to think a little bit about the physical security of the medium. Okay, one more thing to think about is bandwidth. So, bandwidth is the total amount of data that you can send per second through a wire. And if you want to think about it in really simple terms, um, you can just think of bandwidth as the sampling rate multiplied by the bit rate. So the sampling rate tells us how many times a second we're going to record what our value is, and the bit rate tells us the precision in that value. You should remember that from the previous video. Um, so obviously if I want to, let's say, do two bits at a sampling rate of two samples per second, well that means I'm going to need four total bits of information per second. Uh, and as you can see, every time I double the sampling rate or double the bit rate, I double the bandwidth. So the bandwidth is my total amount of data, my total ones and zeros that I have to transmit every second. Um, and now, so if I increase either one, the bit rate or the sampling rate, the bandwidth increases. Now naturally, we generally want, therefore, as high a bandwidth as possible in all our communications techniques, so we can send as much data as we like. So let's think about the channels of communication. You're going to go away and research four types of communication. first one is twisted pair, that was the most traditional one. So the early um, Morse code was sent over twisted pair wires. It was really simple, you either complete a circuit, so you send a voltage difference down the two wires, or you have no voltage difference between them. And that's essentially how it still works today. Your network cables use basically that same principle. They have a high voltage every time they want to send a one, this is the low voltage every time they want to send a zero. Coax cable is a little bit different. Coax cable has one single data transmission uh, wire in the center, and it's surrounded by shielding for another wire. Now you're going to do a little bit of research on why that second wire um, that shields around the outside of it is important. Uh, the third method is radio waves. Um, there are different, different types of radio waves. Uh, we can have sky wave, ground wave, um, and we can have space wave. So research those three and tell me the differences between them. And then the final one is fibre optics. Fibre optics are a really, really thin piece of glass, and if you send light into it, it will totally internally reflect all the way down the glass. You've done this at GCSE, you should be familiar with the basics of it. What I now need you to do is go through your book, have a look at these three methods, and then explain how each one is good or bad at getting rid of crosstalk, signal attenuation, uh, and how good it is for security and bandwidth. Have fun!